This show is brought to you by KetConnection.com. Draft beverage supplies and solutions. Keck Connection has the experience and the expertise to get you set up. Tap your favorite craft beer, homebrew, wine, cold brew, kombucha, sparkling water, and more at home with ease using a KetConnection.com dispensing kit. Go to KetConnection.com, use our promo code BNW, that's for Booze News Weekly, and save 10% off your first order. Some restrictions may apply. Visit KetConnection.com for more details. Coming up on this episode of Booze News Weekly, Dogfish Head and Patagonia collaborate, U.S. liquor laws are evolving, and women are leading Barcelona's craft beer revolution. It's Monday, March 21st, 2022. Welcome to this episode of Booze News Weekly, your source for weekly beverage industry news and commentary delivered quickly and conveniently. My name is Joshua Steubing. If you haven't already, click that like button below, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification icon to make sure you never miss an episode. Now let's take a look at the headlines of the week. Our first headline comes from thefullpint.com. Dogfish Head and Patagonia Provisions collab on Kernza Pills. In a continuing effort to scale regenerative farming practices, Patagonia Provisions and Dogfish Head Craft Brewery have partnered to launch Kernza Pills, a distinctively crisp and refreshing German-style Pilsner beer made with Kernza, a remarkable perennial grain that draws down carbon from the atmosphere and sequesters it to the ground. Hitting shelves and taps starting today in select markets, Coast to Coast Kernza Pills is one of the most widely distributed Kernza-based beers on the market and marks a significant shift towards a more climate-friendly brewing industry. In 2008, the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, made a breakthrough in regenerative agriculture with the development of a perennial grain called Kernza. Whereas most grains are planted and harvested annually, Kernza stays in the ground year after year, developing roots up to 12 feet long. Perennial crops like Kernza are beneficial to the environment as they protect soil from erosion and improve soil structure. They increase ecosystem nutrient retention, carbon sequestration, and can contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation. And in the case of Kernza, they lend a uniquely nutty flavor that makes a delicious beer. The Patagonia Provisions and Dogfish Head collaborative launch of Kernza Pills marks an important milestone in scaling Kernza. Sitting at 5.0% ABV, Kernza Pills is an earthy, aromatic, and noticeably refreshing pilsner brewed with organic malted barley, organic Contessa hops, and of course, Kernza perennial grain. The melodic interplay of the Kernza and Contessa hops provide the beer with its distinct flavor profile. The Kernza adds a subtle, spicy warmth to the beer, while the organic Contessa hops with notes of pear and green tea give it a bright floral character and uniquely crisp, clean drinkability. Quote, We create each of our products with a solutions-based mindset, discovering and incorporating ingredients that help to solve the environmental crisis, says Birgit Cameron, co-founder and head of Patagonia Provisions. He continued, together with Dogfish Head, were able to spotlight the important and pioneering work of the Land Institute. By creating market pool for a regenerative crop like Kerns of Perennial Grain, we hope to incentivize farmers and brewers to shift in this direction and to further our commitment to being in the business of saving our home planet. The launch of Kerns of Pills represents the collective action of Patagonia Provisions and Dogfish Head taking steps towards scaling regenerative crops to inspire change in the brewing industry. Patagonia Provisions believes the future of farming and our planet lies in regenerative and organic agriculture, a practice that restores soil biodiversity, sequesters carbon, and grows crops without chemical fertilizers or pesticides. Similarly, Dogfish Head is committed to continuing to amplify its use of regenerative and organically grown brewing ingredients. Quote, Dogfish Head first brewed a beer with organic ingredients in 1995 when we used an organic Mexican coffee to create our chicory stout, says Cam Calagione. Calagione, I always forget how to pronounce his name. Calagione, <laughs> Dogfish Head brewer, founder and brewer. He continues, since then, we have brewed countless beers with organic and regenerative ingredients and have partnered with numerous organizations committed, committed to addressing climate change and other environmental issues like the Nature Conservancy 
Conservancy, I said that right, to whom we have donated more than $1 million collectively since 2007. While Dogfish Head has always been focused on introducing high-quality culinary ingredients into the brewing process, in creative ways, this partnership with Patagonia Provisions allows them to shine a spotlight on Kernza, a hard-working grain that not only tastes good, but does good. Continuing diverse perennial grain agriculture holds great promise to reverse and regenerate the degradation of the soils, resources, and species upon which human life depends, said Rachel Strohr, president of the Land Institute. She continues, but the true power of perennial grains will only be realized when grown on the landscape at scale. Partners like Patagonia Provisions and Dogfish Head are leading the movement to get perennial crops like Kernza on more acres across the country. And when it comes to perennials, more is better. I feel like regenerative is the word of the day. This was an episode of Sesame Street. Regenerative. It's good, right? I I think I'm a fan of Earth. I'm not going to probably be here a terribly long time in the bigger picture of Earth. But the better we can treat the planet, the better we're all off, right? We agree on that. I am interested in trying this because for me, ultimately, and this is my selfishness talking, if it doesn't taste good, I don't care. I just want it to taste good. But I imagine a, a, a brewery like Dogfish Head who knows what they're doing, no strangers to craft beer, no strangers to innovation in our craft beer space. I imagine that they're they're giving it their all. So it, it'll be interesting to see because if, if Kernza too, I didn't look into it beyond this article which again comes from uh, the full pint.com i wonder if it's easily growable too like if if it's something i know they want to make it larger at scale but is this something that uh because it's been you know it's lab made is, is it make it better for different types of environments to grow in or uh you know for for certain types of soils because you know, I, I don't know. My whole knowledge base on agriculture is from that ride at Disney World living with the land. I think it's at Epcot. That's all I really know about the earth and, and agriculture. <laughs> so um, maybe that's right now when I'll queue up the music for that ride. No, I won't because we don't have licensing agreements with Disney. But my point being, stories like this make me feel good because it's nice to know that people and even even in our space in our realm the craft beer industry that they're doing what they can for sustainability on the planet and you know maybe it, it seems kind of kitschy or markety gimmicky whatever but I, I give them the benefit of the doubt that they're trying to do good with what they have and if the pilsner tastes good that's all that matters to me Our second article for this week is an opinion piece from Reason.com. The headline, Across the Country, Liquor Laws Are Evolving. In states across the country, liquor laws are evolving. Hey, that was the headline. Though some states are embracing the need to alleviate the crushing regulatory burden faced by producers, sellers, and consumers alike, they're moving too slowly, while others are moving in the wrong direction entirely. In Rhode Rhode Island, for example, lawmakers are considering legalizing party bites, the oversized bicycles that a dozen or so peddlers often featuring a bartender or they'll travel from bar to bar. That's great news for local motel owner and Miss Kwamekut, I think I said that right, who spent $30,000 on a party bike his town had greenlighted only to be thwarted by the state's motor vehicle department. Quote, The party bike couldn't use public streets without a license, but they had no license to give it, the Providence Journal reported last week. It is too large to be considered a bicycle and too small or too slow, rather, to qualify as a motor vehicle. In Alaska, state lawmakers are pursuing, quote, a wholesale rewrite of the state's alcohol laws. Local station KTUU reported last month that one key element of the proposed overhaul results from so-called bar wars that have pitted bar owners in that state against brewers and distillers that operate tasting rooms. The bar owners want the state government to protect them from competition from those tasting rooms. That's clearly in the wrong. The government shouldn't protect any business from competition, this article says, but wrong as the bar and restaurant lobby is in this case, it's also powerful. Hence the proposed, quote, wholesale rewrite as it applies to tasting rooms, which includes underwhelming improvements such as allowing them to stay open until 10 p.m. instead of 8 p.m. and allowing no more than one new tasting room in communities with at least 12,000 residents would likely come closer to maintaining the status quo than it would to improving the regulatory climate for producers and consumers in the state. 
That's one reason, no doubt, the supporters of the bill refer to it as a grand or delicate compromise. And some other changes to state booze laws are also pedestrian at best. In New York, for example, state liquor regulators are regulators regulators are now allowing movie theater patrons to drink beer, wine, and cider in theaters. This week, a pair of upstate theaters became the first in New York to allow the practice. Quote, previously, theaters were restricted to consumption inside a cafe area adjoining the lobby. The Saratogian reported. Saratogian? Saratogian. I am terrible at pronunciating things. Pronunciating? Pronouncing things today. <laughs> Noting that it took a decade of lobbying for the simple change to take effect. Continuing, quote, Or, if the theater had a full restaurant kitchen, theater staff were only permitted to bring beverages to a patron at their seat with a fixed table. To New York's credit, the state is also streamlining some other alcohol rules. For example, recently installed Governor Kathy Hochul announced this week that bar and restaurant owners will now be able to buy liquor licenses online, which she noted was a long overdue modernization. Though slight progress appears to have been made in New York, Rhode Island, and Alaska, These states' modest deregulatory moves seem downright radical when compared to what's happening in other states. In Utah, for example, a bill that's expected to become law will mean the end of many hard seltzer sales in all but liquor stores. The ban targets seltzers that contain ethyl alcohol, a common stabilizer that's used to help flavor many seltzers, and also soda, mustard, and teriyaki sauce which amounts to about half the hard seltzers currently sold in Utah, including ones marketed by Budweiser, Coors, Truly, and Vizzy. Those seltzers will now be sold only at state liquor stores. If the Utah story seems ridiculous to you, news out of out of Alabama may take the cake. That state's private liquor stores are gearing up to sue the state's liquor regulatory agency, which wants to allow state-run liquor stores to deliver alcohol. As AL.com explains, the Alabama legislator last year moved to allow private liquor stores to deliver some alcohol. And that's good news. But the delivery law covers licensees, and the private liquor stores note that state-run stores, unlike them, don't require licenses to operate. The state-run stores are also not required to pay local sales or liquor taxes, AL.com noted. In other words, the state of Alabama is senselessly in the business of competing with private sellers of the same products, already has an unfair competitive advantage when it comes to such sales, and seems unwilling, pardon me, and seems willing to ignore a state law in order to obtain still more of a competitive advantage. So why do states such as Utah and Alabama continue to sell liquor? ABC's more than eight decades of selling liquor has been brought to you in large part by an unholy alliance of lobbyists, government bureaucrats, and religious groups, not to mention the landlords and special interests who collect millions from leasing land and providing other services to support the state's alcohol operation, an op-ed critical of the state's needless involvement in alcohol noted last year. Indeed, the less government involvement in the alcohol market, from production sales to sales and consumption, the better off consumers and producers are. When it comes to regulating alcohol, kowtowing to special interests, especially the state itself, is like putting a kryptonite lock on a party bike. No fun. I included this op. I I like hearing other people's opinions, and and I'm sorry for reading the whole thing. Um, I will say this, and it may be an unpopular opinion, but I don't like asking permission. I don't like it, especially in one of these kinds of, like, I don't need the state to, to tell me what time my liquor store can sell me beer or, or whiskey or gin or booze. I don't, I, I don't need that protection. And I, I don't think that it should be a controversial opinion that adults should make decisions for themselves and private business should operate how private business wants to operate. I like the concept of state get out of the way, you know, uh, you're going to, you're going to tax me anyway on the sales of the stuff. Just make sure the road doesn't have potholes, which, uh, San Marcos where I'm at now is not bad with roads where I came from, which is uh, closer to Austin. I-, I was extremely annoyed because it's like, man, my taxes are growing up every year and every road has all these potholes on it. What's going on? But, uh, story, you know, op-ed pieces like this opinion pieces, like from reason, which I, you know, for transparency's sake, I don't read reason a bunch, but it is a very, um, anti-government type of site. So spoiler, if you didn't get that from that article, but I was looking in the news section of Google and this popped up and it's so interesting to me how different state by state alcohol laws are. I thought Texas had some archaic alcohol laws in regards to how we can share 
or brew or sell craft beer specifically in the state of Texas. I always felt that it's archaic. But then you look at uh, Alabama, you're like, oh, my gosh, I guess we're not that bad. But both are bad, right? (laughs) Both are uh, subjectively, uh, debatably, they're bad. But anyways, I, I, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Do you like having the government making sure everything goes through them first and then, you know, with permission, you're able to purchase or resell or brew? Or do you think the less regulation over alcohol consumption, sales, marketing, all the above is a better way of allowing the market to operate. So let me know again what you think in the comments below. And our last article for the week, if you thought I was butchering pronunciations, I haven't even proofread this one yet. So it, but, but the headline, yeah, <laughs> women leading Barcelona's craft beer revolution from the guardian.com. It was Steve Hutsley a Liverpudlian and long-term Barcelona resident who introduced the city to craft beer when he opened the Barcelona Brewing Company in 1993. But it was a woman, Judith Cartex, who helped establish Barcelona as Spain's craft beer capital. Quote, beer has always been a part of my life, she says. We were poor and all we had to drink was tap water, not even Coca-Cola. Except on Sundays, my mother and my grandmother would open a liter bottle of beer to watch football on TV. Very English, no? Continuing, it was Steve who opened our eyes to the possibilities of craft beer, not just in Barcelona, but in the rest of Spain. Cartets, who learned her trade from Huxley and ran her own brewery, Cerveza Bada, until the floor collapsed and the building was condemned. Eek. As a brewer, you feel you're contributing to the common good, and it's not a job, it's a vocation, says Covadonga Garcia Perez, 24, one of the many female brewers in this traditionally male world. She brews at La Textil, a sleek new brew pub in central Barcelona that is also a restaurant and a music venue. Garcia Perez is collaborating with another young woman, Cristina Fernandez Romero, 27, who usually works at Espiga, a brewery just outside the city, but has joined her at La Testa on a brewing project. They have named their new beer Punto Violeta after the campaign to provide safe public places for women who are being harassed. Quote, we want to reflect that women are welcome with open arms in the world of craft brewing, they said. Respectively, from Asturias and Madrid, the two ended up in Barcelona because, quote, this is where it all began and was where, pardon me, and where there are more craft beer bars and breweries. Fernandez Romero says she became interested in brewing during her Erasmus year in the Czech Republic, where she was astonished at the range of different beers. Quote, I was amazed at using the same products you could make so many different kinds of beers, she says. A hundred miles from Barcelona, Quinonia Pujo, I know I butchered that, has taken things a step further, brewing beer from barley and hop she grows on her own farm in the village of Almaceas. I don't drink commercial beer, and when we started this in 2013, it was in order to make beer that I want to drink, says Pujol. We grow everything we need to make ecological craft beer. A beer farm like this is unique in Spain and possibly in Europe. Pujol sells about half the ce- pardon me. Pujol sells about half the cerveza Lovio she produces to bars in Barcelona. She dismisses the concept of a distinctively female brew, a view shared by Cartex, now director of the Brewers' Convention in Brew, who says, quote, I don't think women make different or better beer. The difference is men don't like to admit they don't know something, but women aren't afraid to ask, so we learn more. Okay, yeah, she's right. Uh, Cartex is typically forthright when asked about misogyny in the hitherto male milieu of craft beer. Quote, I worked in construction, I played football, I ride a motorbike, I was a drummer in a rock band. All very male worlds. As a woman in the craft beer scene, I've never had a problem. I'm 53 and I'm a big woman with a lot of attitude and I don't take shit from anyone. It might not be the same for younger women. However, far from encountering opposition, the young brewers collaborating at La Tet still say that men are glad to see more women in the business. Quote, What I like is that when it comes to things that are physically challenging, male colleagues, instead of saying I'll do it, help me find a solution so I can do it myself, says Fernandez Romero. It's a dream doing this job, she adds. I feel like I found my place in the world. We're making something that makes people happy and something they can share. I love stories like this. I agree. When we went uh, as Homebrew Happy Hour to Homebrew Con 
2015, 2016, we interviewed Annie Johnson, who was home brewer of the year uh, for the American Home Brewers Association in some year around then, like 2013, 2014. And she made it a point in our interview for that podcast episode, just talking about how brewing was traditionally actually a, a woman's job, ancient brewing, right? Because it was cooking. It's cooking. For me, brewing feels a lot more like janitorial. But at the end of the day, it's cooking. And um, seeing more women as, you know, I'm a father. I've got three daughters. My wife has no interest in brewing or, or, or consuming, at least. She'll humor me at brew days when we, we do them, but uh, hardly ever involved. But I like the idea of getting, of the craft being carried by whomever. And if women are leading the revolution in this place, great. Maybe that'll get more people of all backgrounds to want to be more interested in good craft beer. Not dogging macro breweries and big the beer the big beer lobby necessarily, because I'd love for them to sponsor the show. I'm kidding, sort of. Uh <laughs> No, I am kidding. But I, I I, think craft beer, local artisan type stuff is my favorite. You know, I like supporting local when I can. And the fact that it happens to be women here in Spain, I think that's fantastic. I think that's good exposure for craft beer overall. I think it's good exposure for getting other young women or women of any age into brewing and, and seeing how rewarding of a craft it is, even if it's at the home brewing level. It's nice seeing representation in a one of my favorite things to do in the world, which is brew beer. But uh, this also gives me an excuse to want to go to Barcelona because maybe I can write it off on a work trip and say like, oh yeah, we're doing, a, we're, we're following up on this story from Guardian. But I also want to add, this is kind of digressing. All the stories today had these big words that I should have proofread the articles. But if you're still with me on this video, I appreciate y'all sticking with me because editing on these shows is such a minimal. And I don't think if I went back and did like two or three tapes of a word that I was going to get it anyway. And I did on one of them do a Google search, how to pronounce this. And I got like, eight different answers. So if you ever know how to correct me on pronunciation of something I say on the show, leave it in the comments below. You can't hurt my feelings. Correcting me is the right thing to do, and uh, it'll make for better content in the future. But anyways, that's it for this week. If you have any tips or industry news, email them to me, Joshua, at homebrewhappyhour.com, or use the hashtag BNW on social media. You can find this episode and so much more content available at homebrewhappyhour.com. Make sure you visit our sponsor, kekinetchen.com. Use our promo code BNW for 10% off your first order. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.